disclaimer, this story contains unhealthy relationship dynamics and other content that modern viewers might find upsetting. Listen at your own risk. Hi, I'm Morgan, and today I will be reading from The Man Without a Heart by Ruby M. Ayers, and I will be continuing where I left off at the beginning of Chapter 9. In spite of Barbara's objection, Edmund had insisted on paying for her rooms at the London Hotel. You've suffered disgracefully at the hands of my precious brother-in-law, he said obstinately, and at least you must let me do, do this to try and make up to you in some small way. After all, and he smiled, we are good friends, Barbie. Yes, I know, but oh, very well. She was too tired to argue. She gave in resignedly and stood by while he engaged a bedroom and sitting room for her. I shan't be here long, she told him as they turned away from the bureau together. I must get something to do. I've come to the conclusion that laziness doesn't suit me. Besides, I haven't enough money. Hyde flushed. I wish you'd let me help you. Barbara laughed and shook her head. Thank you. <laughs> but I like my independence. She held out her hand remorsefully, struck by the mortification in his face. Don't look like that. You've been very kind to me. I only wish I could help you, Edmund. What are you going to do about Linda? What can I do? She hates me. She won't live with me again. I know that. He made a hopeless gesture. Everyone says I ought to divorce her, and I would if I and I would if I thought there was a certainty of that cur marrying her. If Mr. Asher, Barbara began and stopped. Hyde laughed. <laughs> if Asher gets on Langley's track, he said, it will mean a broken neck. And when shall I? And when shall I see you again? Barbara asked as they said goodbye. She dreaded being left. I'll come tomorrow. I'll come early, he promised. He lifted her hand to his lips. Goodbye, Barbie, and God bless you. Barbara made no answer, but there were smarting tears in her eyes as she went upstairs. The strain of the last weeks had told upon her the strain of the last weeks had told upon her more severely than she had guessed. She felt as if she had she felt as if she was on the verge of a bad breakdown as she shut the door and walked over to the fire in the little sitting room. She clenched her hands and bit her lip to keep back the tears of sheer weakness that would rise. I won't cry. I won't, she told her, she told herself fiercely. There's nothing for me to cry about. I'm safe and I'm free. She took off her hat and coat and bathed her face in cold water. She felt better and began to unpack her boxes, shaking out the crumpled frocks. One, the frock she had worn that last night at Linda's, she held for some time, looking at it with a queer expression in her eyes. It seemed to bring back the warm sil silence of the garden and the deep, attractive voice of Rufus Asher as he sat beside her as he sat beside her under the big tree and told her about the life from which he had come. She had thought a great deal about Asher after they parted. She had lain awake for a long time with the rumble of that haunting foxtrot tune in her head, thinking of his cynical words and the contrasting gentleness of his smile. And men who've stayed home all their lives are dancing every night with other fellows' wives. Well, it was true. There were so many cases of which she herself knew, where the modern love of gaiety and amusement had sown the first seed of dissension between husband and wife, and finally ended in disaster. Barbara loved fun and dancing as much as any other girl, but there had been times when she had longed for something better, to which she could not put a name. This man is different, quite different, had been her first thought after her talk in the garden with Rufus Asher. This man is someone worthwhile. He had, so, he had soon shown her her mistake, for he had accused her, without giving her a chance to deny or defend herself, of an unspeakable thing, and he had treated her with the utmost contempt and disrespect. I ought to hate him, she thought, in wonder and helplessness, and yet I don't. I'm only sorry for him. And she wondered what he was doing, and who would dress his wounded shoulder for him. Nevertheless, she slept well and dreamlessly that night, and woke late into the morning to find sunlight in her room, and to see by her and to see by her watch that it was past ten. She rang for her breakfast and began to dress. There was nothing to hurry for, no fires to light this morning, or breakfast to lay for a surly giant, but she thought of the little living room of the cottage with strange wistfulness. Was Asher still there? What was he doing? Poor man. After all, he had suffered much, must still be suffering. His love for his sister was the best thing in his life, 
and it had been destroyed and it had been betrayed. As Barbara was brushing her hair, the telephone bell whirred. That you, Barbie? Yes. Oh yes, Edmund. I'm sorry. I can't get round till after lunch. I hope you'll be all right. She laughed, trying to hide her disappointment. <laughs> Quite all right. What time will you come? As soon as I can. About three, I hope. Will you be in? I will wait for you. And Edmund, is there any news of Linda? She heard a short, unhappy laugh. <laughs> yes, you'll know soon. Goodbye. She rang off and went back to the dressing table. She had counted on seeing Edmund that morning. She laid down the brush and poured out a fresh cup of tea. No need to hurry after all. She had all the morning to get through. The fire had been lit in the little sitting room, which led from her bedroom, and she took the tea in there and sat down in a big chair, resting her feet on the fender. It was strange how her thoughts, had, how her thoughts turned again and again to Asher. What was he doing? Who had got his breakfast for him? I don't know why I bother about him, she thought. He was a brute to me. I don't know why I give him a thought. There was a knock at the door, and she turned. Come in. There was the barest hesitation, and then Rufus Asher walked into the room. Barbara sat like a figure of stone, her lips parted, her eyes wide, staring blankly at him. Then she rose stiffly to her feet. Mr. Asher. Her voice was only a whisper, and her heart beat so fast that it seemed to be choking her. Asher shut the door and came forward. Yes, I suppose you were hardly expecting me. Barbara put her cup down on the table. She was trembling violently, and she raised one shaking hand to push back the loose waves of hair, which fell about her face and shoulders. Why are you here? Who allowed you to come up? Is Edmund? Is he? Asher laughed roughly. Oh, Edmund, I knew that was it. He stood still for a moment, breathing fast, staring at her with a strange express expression in his eyes. Then he strode forward and caught her wrist and fingers of steel. A pretty fool you've made of me, you and he, he said thickly. In spite of his roughness, the touch of his fingers upon her wrist seemed to steady her, and her voice was almost controlled as she answered him. I don't know what you mean. What is the matter? If you are ill. He seemed not to hear her. He seemed not to hear. I was a fool to believe you. I ought to have seen through the game. How did you let him know where you were? How did he find you? Tell me, tell me. He shook her as if she had been a child, and Barbara caught her breath. Mr. Asher, if you are a gentleman. I'm not. I don't pretend to be. But I'm honest. You got word somehow to Edmund Hyde, dear lover. And he came. He came with that precious cock and bull story about Linda, about my sister. And I was fool enough to believe you both. It was only afterwards, when you had gone, that I realized how easily I'd been fooled. Fooled! He was mad, she told herself. And yet there was no terror of him in her heart. Her, and her voice was gentle when she spoke. You are wrong. Quite wrong in what you think. Mr. Hyde is not here, and he has never been anything to me. Anything but a friend. He loves his wife, your sister. Oh, Mr. Asher, please believe me. Some day you'll be sorry. He broke in with a harsh laugh. <laughs> sorry? I'm sorry now. Sorry that when I had you all to myself, I didn't make you mine. I was a fool. Why need I have, have hung back for a scruple when he, that blackguard, with a sudden fierce movement, he caught her in his arms. I want you. I've always wanted you. Before I knew anything of this, I wanted you. It was love then. I could have worshipped you as no woman has ever been worshipped, if you'd been, if you'd been what I thought you to be. But what does it matter? He bent his head over. Kiss me, Barbara. I don't care what you are, what you've been. She fought him with all her strength. Oh, you are cruel, cruel. Let me go, let me go. For God's sake, I beg of you to think what you are doing. He only laughed. <laughs> I love you. Turn your face to me. Let me kiss you. I beg of you, I beg of you. It's too late. I don't care any more for scruples and fine conventions. I'll take you back to the cottage or abroad, anywhere you like. He caught her hand and lifted it to his lips. I can love you as well as Edmund or any other man. He broke off as he felt her relax in his arms. She had not fainted, but for a moment she leaned helplessly against him, her face as white as death, and the tears tumbling sorrowfully down her cheeks. Rufo, 
It was the first time she had ever called him by his Christian name, and the sound of it spoke in her voice, and the sound of it spoken in her voice was like a gentle hand laid on the heat of his passion. For a moment he hesitated, and in that moment she seized her chance. Let me tell you something before before you make me hate you forever. I suppose anything I can say will be useless, quite useless, but if you will listen to me for a moment, Rufus, I could have loved you if you had let me that night at Linda's. I thought of you so much after we said good night. I thought how much more worthwhile you were than any other man I knew. He took his arms from about her and stood back a step, staring at her, and she went on again, all the time feeling her own helplessness. I would have married you then if you'd asked me. I hated leaving your sister's house because it meant leaving you. That is the truth. That is the truth, she said faintly. There was a great silence. Then Asher laughed, a brutal laugh of sheer disbelief. <laughs> and you expect me to believe you, he scoffed. You're clever. You're more clever than I thought. But I'm wise to you now. You're mine, and I'm not going to leave you again. They let me come up to your room because I told them you were my wife. I, Barbara gave a choked cry. <gasps> oh, you brute! You brute! Brute? Am I any more of a brute than the cur who brought you here? Who got you away from me by a trick? There's nothing to choose between us. She made a last desperate effort. Mr. Hyde left me last night. I have not seen him since. Ask the hotel people, he cut in savagely. Ask them. There's no need to ask them. I have seen the register and seen these rooms taken in Hyde's name. I have seen. That is a lie. He took a step towards her. Lie or not, what do I care? I saw it for myself, but it's nothing. Rufus! She fought feebly against, his, against the strength of him. She fought feebly against the strength of his arms, and in spite of her fear and despair, there was yet a tinge of something which was strangely like happiness in her heart. What was the matter with her? Was she as mad as he, that she did not hate him? She felt his lips on hers, strangely gentle, and she closed her eyes as there came a soft rapping at the door. Asher heard it too, and involuntarily his arms relaxed. Barbara rallied with a supreme effort and tore herself free. She, t she stumbled across the room and dragged open the door. She forgot her disheveled appearance. Then as, she saw, then, as she saw who stood outside, she fell back with a strangled cry, for it was Asher's sister. The only sound that broke the silence was the man's heavy breathing. He stood with his big hands clasped into fists, his eyes fierce, and ugly patches of red streaking his face. He looked like a man who has suddenly been roused from sleep, or who has struggled out of delirium, as he stared at his sister with dazed eyes, swaying on his feet. Linda spoke first. I suppose I may come in. There was defiance in her pretty voice, and when neither her brother nor Barbara answered, she shrugged her shoulders with a reckless movement as she came forward, shutting the door quietly behind her. I've been to see Edmund, and he threw me out and shut the door in my face. Nobody answered, but a little inarticulate sound broke from Rufus, as if her careless words had mortally hurt him. But she went on. I'm not blaming him. I deserved everything he said. I've treated him rotten rottenly, I know. But I thought, I suppose I was a fool. But I thought he cared enough to take me back. Now I realize what a mistake I've made. Her white face quivered into a smile as she looked at her brother. You always said it was possible to forgive anyone anything, if you only loved them enough, Rufo. You were wrong. It isn't, or else he never really cared. She drew a deep breath, and her eyes, strangely haunted eyes they were, with the deep shadows beneath them, sought Barbara's. I don't know why I've come to you. Edmund said you hated me, and that you would never forgive me for what has happened. Barbara looked up. I don't hate you, she said painfully. I'm only sorry, sorry. Her voice broke on a sob. A flicker of pain crossed Linda's face, but it was gone instantly. I'm sorry, too, she said in a dull sort of way, but it's no use saying that. The past is gone, and I brought it upon myself. I was mad, I suppose. I think all people are a little mad when they fall in love, but that isn't what I came to say. I came to say that I was sorry that, through me, Raffo treated you as he has. It's my fault, all of it. He cared for me so much. I drove him to it, didn't I, Raffo? Astra made no answer, but a little shudder passed through his big frame, and Linda went on. I want you to forgive him. She spoke in a bewildered sort of way. Perhaps you have forgiven him, as he is here? I don't know. Edmund told me where you were staying, and I came because, 
because I know you are kind and tolerant. Her voice changed suddenly, as if the dam of her self-control had broken at last, letting loose the flood of shame and remorse which was, which was rending her. She stumbled forward and fell at Barbara's feet, clasping her round clasping her round the knees and hiding her face. Don't send me away as he did. Don't send me away. I have nowhere to go. Nobody to turn to. I'm frightened. I'm so frightened. Rufus took a quick step forward and with a hand on his sister's shoulder forced her, forced her to raise her head and look at him. Is it true then? You went away with Langley. Yes. Where is he? I don't know. She closed her eyes as if she were fainting. I don't know. He left me. The last words were only a broken whisper, and when they died away, a terrible silence fell on the room. Barbara looked at Asher, and she took a quick step between him and Linda, her hands outstretched to keep him back. No, no, don't hurt her, for she saw such for she saw such a look of mad rage and passion in his eyes that she was terrified. No, no, don't hurt her. She suffered enough, she said. Her face was beautiful in its gentleness and compassion as she stooped and lifted Linda to her feet. Don't be frightened. Don't be frightened. It's all right. You can stay with me. You can stay with me, I promise. And without another look at the man who who had wronged her so terribly, she went past him with her arms still round Linda's sobbing figure and into the bedroom beyond, shutting the door. Asher stood where, the, where they had left him. The rage and passion had died from his face, leaving him with an old and beaten look. He had thought himself so right, so strong, and after all he had been swept away by his own arrogance and narrowness. He had heaped insults and indignities on the woman he loved, and he should have been at her feet in homage and humility. It was the end of everything. There was no longer a place for him in this England which he had so despised and scorned. He must go away, back to the land where hard work and privation had made him and had made him the hard, unjust judge that he was, and try and forget. That was all that was left to him. From behind the closed door he could hear the sound of passionate sobbing and Barbara's voice gently soothing and comforting, and each word she spoke was like a knife turned into turned in his heart. She would never forgive him. He dared not ask or expect it. She would go all the days of her life hating him, shrinking from the sound of his name and from the memory of the past weeks. And she could have loved him. He had heard it from her own lips. Surely his punishment was more than he could bear. Then the dividing door opened, and she stood there before him. She had twisted up her tumbled hair, the sweet, soft hair which in his madness he had kissed, and there were marks of tears on her face, but her eyes were steady and her voice unemotional when she spoke. I will take care of Linda. There is no need for you to wait. They looked at one another for a long moment, and Asher knew it was goodbye. He would never see her again, and of all the passionate words that were surging in his heart, he could not utter one. When at last he found his voice, it was hoarse with the depths of emotions which were choking him. I can't ask you to forgive me. I can't tell you what I feel. I should like to fall at your feet, as my sister did, and say, as she did, don't send me away. Don't send me away. I have nowhere to go, nobody to turn to, but I know it would be useless. There was an agonized note of questioning in the last word, but the seconds passed and Barbara made no answer, and he drew a hard breath and turned blindly. I've only one excuse, he said thickly, which will be no excuse to you, I know. I loved you. He waited yet another moment, but Barbara did not speak, and he went out, shutting the door behind him. Barbara went back to where Linda sat crouched by the fire. Asher had gone. She tried to feel glad, to tell herself that now all her troubles were at an end, and that she need never see him again. But Linda's first words killed the thought. Oh, Barbie, you did forgive him, didn't you? Forgive him? Linda rose. She looked forlorn and wretched enough. All her prettiness seemed to have been washed away in the passionate floods that had swept over her during the past weeks. She looks old, old, was the thought in Barbara's heart, but she only said, forgive him. Why should I forgive him? I never, de I never deserved to be treated as he treated me. Linda crept up and, Linda crept up and diffidently touched her hand. Yet you can forgive me, she whispered, and what I've done is so much worse. Barbara turned away, the hot color rushing to her face. Yes, 
that was true. And she sought vainly in her mind for the explanation. It was there in her heart, though she would not admit of its existence, there in her heart, waiting to be recognized and claimed. But she said, don't let us talk of it. Please don't let us talk of it. I want to forget, forget. Linda laughed, a tragic little laugh. <laughs> if only one could forget. If one could only take hold of a memory and destroy it. But we can't. We can't. It's there forever. Forever. She began to pace the room feverishly, bright color burning her haggard face. Oh, I've been a fool. A fool, she said, striking her little useless hands together. I thought he was so different. I thought he would love me forever. And then her voice fell to a tragic whisper. Barbie, he never meant to marry me. He never, even his, in his thoughts, raised me to the dignity of his wife. Barbara cried out at the pain in her voice. Oh, he is a brute, a brute. I hope there will be a special little hell for such men. You called Rufo a brute, Linda said, but he would never treat a woman as Hugh Langley has treated me. Oh, I must have been mad. I must have been mad. Forget it, my dear. Try and forget it. I'll be your friend always. I'll never leave, I'll never leave you, whatever happens. Linda fell to bitter sobbing. <laughs> I wish I could die. I wish I could die. Barbara stroked her hair with gentle fingers. You've got Rufus, she said. It was difficult for her to speak Asher's name. He loves you. He'll never leave you. Ruffo, Linda raised her tragic eyes. He's done with me, too. I knew it as soon as I came into the room and saw him. He'll never forgive me because of you. He'll blame me, he'll blame me to the end of my life. And he's right, because whatever he did to you, it was done for me. It was my fault. Oh, I am not fit to live. Edmund was right. I'm not fit to live. Edmund is wicked to have said such a thing, Barbara said indignant, ind indignantly. None of us are such saints that we can afford to throw stones. Linda caught Barbara's hand and raised it to her lips. Oh, you, you're an angel. I'm not worth it. You would do far better to leave me to myself. I'm no good to anyone. Barbara soothed her as best she could. You're ill and tired. We'll have something to eat, and then you must rest. I'll stay with you. I promise you I will. She made Linda take some food and persuaded her to lie down. I shall not be able to sleep. I only wish I could, were Linda's last sobbing words. I only wish I could go to sleep and never wake up any more. But she fell into a fitful doze, and Barbara sat beside her, lost in thought, every nerve in her body aching. I've only one excuse. I loved you. The words haunted her and would not be driven from her thoughts. What would he do? Where would he go? Not that she cared, but... The telephone bell whirred from the next room, and she rose and went to answer it. Mr. Hyde to see you, madame. She had forgotten that Edmund was coming that afternoon. She spoke hurriedly in answer. Tell Mr. Hyde I cannot see him, that I am engaged, that I will write. Mr. Hyde is on his way up to your room, madame. So it was too late. She hung up the receiver and went back to Linda, dreading to find her awake, but she was still lying with closed eyes and breathing gently, and Barbara went back to the sitting room, closing the door tightly. She heard Edmund's knock almost at once and went to admit him. You can't come in. I'm sorry, but can't come in? What has happened? I want to tell you about Linda. Let me in, Barbara. I'm half of my head with worry. Barbara hesitated, then told him the truth. Linda is here now, with me. Here? With you? She saw the dull red that flooded his face, and the sudden trembling of his mouth, and she said, She's very unhappy, Edmund. I don't think she can bear any more. She's asleep now. Please, just leave her alone. She came to me this morning. I was a brute. I drove her away. I've been mad with remorse since. I'm afraid. Oh, my God. You don't know the hell I've gone through. He raised his clenched fists. If I find Langley, my God, I'll kill him. Hush, hush. She looked back apprehensively to the closed door. Don't wake her, Edmund. Let her sleep while she can. He caught her hand. You'll take care of her. You'll be kind to her. My poor little girl. You know I will. And tell her, tell her, he broke off, his face working, and for a moment he could not continue. Then he said huskily, If there is anything I can do for her, anything, I didn't mean to be a brute. I know. I'll tell her. And 
you'll write to me. Yes. God bless you. He wrung her hand hard and went away. And Barbara tiptoed softly in the, into the room where Linda slept. But she had not moved. She was lying with one hand beneath her cheek as a child sleeps. Her lips parted and the tears wet on her face. She looked almost like a child. She looked almost as innocent. And yet during the past few days, dishonor and misery had made shipwreck of her life. Barbara drew up a chair and sat down. I've only one excuse. I loved you. How the words haunted her. She put her hands over her ears with the hope that she could shut them out, but it was impossible. I loved you. I loved you. They filled the room to the exclusion of all else beside. They were with her when at last she fell into a troubled sleep of sheer exhaustion. It was getting dark when she woke. The fire was out and the room was cold and filled with shadows. The yellow light from a street lamp outside shone into the room like a watchful eye. And Barbara started up, her heart beating fast, bewildered, forgetting where she was. The memory returned and she crossed the room and groped for the electric switch. How long had she slept? And what had become of Linda? Then she turned towards the bed and saw that it was empty. There was a little hollow where Linda had lain, and the rumpled pillow, and something pinned to it. Barbara's hands were like ice as she stumbled across the room and snatched up the paper with its hastily scribbled message. I can't bear it. I can't be I can't go on living. God bless you for being so good to me. I kissed you just now as you slept. Goodbye. Signed Linda. Gone. For a moment, Barbara felt that the shock had turned her to stone. Gone? To what? To death? Oh, no, not that! Power of thought and action came back to her with a dread, and a moment later she was out in the street and breathlessly directing a taxi driver to Edmund Hyde's hotel. And hurry, 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 she sobbed. And that is the end of chapter nine of The Man Without a Heart by Ruby M. Ayers. Thank you for listening to this chapter with me, and I hope that you come back for the next video so that you can see how like this story continues. Have a great day!